Welcome to the Tuesday, June 16th, 2020 electronic meeting of the Ann Arbor Parks Advisory Commission. This meeting is in accordance with executive orders from the governor to affect social distancing and mitigate the spread of the COVID-19 virus. We intend to conduct this meeting similarly to an in-person meeting. However, please be patient if there are technical issues. Public comment will be via telephone only. To speak during any of the public comment periods, please call 1-888-788-0099 and enter meeting ID 9324290. Six five six six one. This information is also available on the published agenda in the public notices section of the city website and on the broadcast of this meeting on CTN channel 16, AT&T channel 99, and online at www.a2gov.org backslash watch CTN. So we will move into our agenda. Um, first on the agenda is the roll call. If you could do that for us, Colin. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Morrison. Here. Commissioner London. Here. Commissioner Borgsdorf. Here. Commissioner Apple. Commissioner Kraut. Here. Commissioner Skylas. Here. Commissioner Ramaswamy. Here. Commissioner Gallardi. Council Member Grand. Here. And Council Member Hayner. Here. You have a quorum. Great. Thanks, Colin. Mm -hmm. um, next item approval of the agenda, which was sent out ahead of time. Are there any changes or amendments to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on to item four. First, public comment. Kristen, do we have any members of the public who would like to comment? No speakers at this time. Let's give it a, um, a few seconds for anyone who may be calling in. Okay. All right, no speakers. Okay, thanks, Krista. Moving on to item five, approval of minutes from the previous meeting. So attached in the packet were the minutes of the January 28th, 2020 PAC meeting. Seems crazy that that was the last time we met, um, but is there a motion to approve the minutes from January 28th, 2020? So moved. Uh, moved by Lauren. We know a second. A second by Pravina. Any comments or questions? Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 I guess, Colin, is it best we raise our hands versus verbal? Um, I would be fine if raised hands, I think, could be easier on that. Um, item six presentations. We don't have any presentations today. Item seven report. We have a report from Colin. Yeah, let me see if I can share my screen here. Can everybody see this? Yes. Yeah, okay. So for today, the presentation really is entirely about uh, park operations under COVID-19 or the coronavirus and where we have uh, come from and where we are today and hope to get to in the future. I wanted just to give an overview of everything which I have been trying to share via email, but just kind of a condensed version of it for everyone. 
So, so to start with, this actually started almost over three months ago which is kind of hard to believe, but back March the 12th was when the city began to alter operations as a result of COVID-19. And within actually two weeks in response to Governor Whitmer's order, all park facilities, amenities, and programs were closed. And at that time, uh, people were encouraged to hike, bike, walk, and run. And that was when we started to hear the phrase, stand six feet away, and the no gatherings with others uh, outside of your household. At that time, we, we started to share messages over social media, website updates, emails, subscribers, etc., uh, to try to share information about what was closed and how people could still use the park safely. Um, on this slide is just an example of that, which I think was actually out today again on Instagram, just uh, explaining to people how to use the border to border trail safely. We um, started very early on in the process to issue refunds. Staff, I think, did a really good job of trying to do this proactively. There's a lot of stress and confusion that people were going through at this time. And it seems like if there was one thing that we could do easily, it was to make sure that people were. Uh, receiving refunds in a timely fashion, and I think that worked pretty well. At this time, park staff had to work from home unless they were performing essential work, which, as uh, explained by the executive order, was the maintenance of safe and sanitary public parks. So we would have staff come in occasionally to do things that really basically related to public safety. Moving forward a couple of weeks, April 8th, we had to go out to remove the tennis nets and to cover the basketball rooms because people were quite simply not really uh, heeding the signage that was asking them to stay off of these facilities. Um, starting April 20th, we started to mow. Uh, park operations was actually working in split shifts. So we had half the team in, one week and then half the team the next week. April 24th, the day at home was extended to May 15th and there was a new executive order was released which allowed for the hiking, biking, walking, running, but also allowed um, people to actually boat and golf. And as a result of that, May 1st, the city golf courses were able to open in kind of an amended fashion. This latest executive order also allowed for uh, what is underlined on this slide or other similar activity, which, as you can imagine, led to quite a lot of debate and um, trying to understand how to best interpret that. As a result, we were able to reopen some other facilities that after review, we believe could be uh, enjoyed while adhering to physical distancing and other uh, precautions. May 9th, we were able to reopen the farmer's market into phase one. We moved to phase two, May 20th. I'll share a little bit more about that later. And it was at this time, actually May 17th, when we made the very hard decision uh, to cancel all of the day camps for summer, and at that time to close the outdoor pools. At the end of May, we were able to open up the liveries at Argo and Gallup in a limited capacity. While people were allowed to vote at the start of May, uh, liveries were not allowed to open until the end of May for the governor's office. Then on June 1st, which was kind of the last major press conference that uh, Whitmer has had, uh, the stay-at-home order, which was supposed to go through the 12th of June, was lifted. Um, that came as a surprise. And there was also information that camps and pools could open on June 8th, along with all other outdoor facilities. What I wanted to do is just to share briefly, these are the six stages to reopen the state of Michigan from 
Governor Whitmer's office. And we are in stage four, and that was where we were at the time of the press conference. Um, from the guidelines outlined here, the idea is that we would be having small gatherings and very low risk uh, businesses would be opening up. Instead, what we've kind of done is even though we're in stage four, Whitmer's office now allows uh, for the restaurants and bars to be open, for example, which is here listed in stage five. And it also allows for the increase in size gatherings, um, which I think you'd have to consider allowing 100 people outside to be a larger gathering than a, a small gathering as kind of anticipated in stage four. Um, part of the reason that I also point this out is we've worked a lot with the county health department throughout this and they've been great. Uh, we work with them in part because they have to inspect all of our outdoor swimming pools in order for us to open. And in conversation with them, and I agree entirely, the anticipation was that pools would perhaps be allowed to open in stage five or possibly even as late as stage six. Nobody saw them as a stage four activity. So staff started to review the possibility of camps and outdoor pools again, understanding the new context provided by the governor. We were able to open up the playgrounds and skate parks, which I think was good. Um, and then we decided on June 10th that we would try to open Fuller Pool July 1st for modified use. And I'll explain a bit more of that in just a little bit. We still uh, recommend that the camps remain canceled and Vets Pool and Bird Pool remain closed. So we'll take a sip of water here. So I pulled out a little bit of information from the emergency order. And I guess I'm really doing this more just to share how kind of throughout this whole process, information has been hard to interpret at times and can be rather gray. So it says here that Restaurants and bars may reopen fully on June 8th. Swimming pool and camp for kids will be permitted to reopen on the same day. Then about two pages later, it says that outdoor services or facilities involving close contact of persons for amusement or other recreational or entertainment purposes remain closed. So it's a little bit hard at times to understand kind of where the order is going and the intent of it. Here's more information from the latest order that is providing us a clear direction as to where to go. We're still not allowed to have indoor, outdoor gatherings now, can go up to 100 people so long as you're maintaining six feet of distance. It's okay to have athletic, athletic practices again. Um, so long as you maintain six feet of distance and outdoor park facilities can be open. Specifically, it's uh, spoke to day camps and said that they could open June 8th, um, but that they had to take the guidance that was provided by Lara licensing and regulatory affairs for the state. And Lara came out with a 22 page uh, 22 page, I suppose they're guidelines uh, for how to conduct camps in COVID. And that came out the day after the governor's press conference. And after staff reviewed it really for kind of three main reasons, well, actually four main reasons, we believe really camp uh, cannot occur this year. One is that we you still have to keep kids six feet apart from one another, which is incredibly difficult to do when you've got camps that are 50 to 60 kids and the majority of the things they're doing are games interacting with one another. But there's a couple of things within the LARA guidelines that we just quite simply can't meet. And one is that one has to have available indoor space to put all your campers so that they can still actually maintain six feet of social distancing when there's inclement weather. And we are not able to meet that, really even come all that close to it, to be honest. Um, 
One of the other big things for Lara is that you have to be able to limit non-essential visitors. In other words, non-campers should be staying away from camp space. Our camps take place at Argo, Gallup, Bure, and Fuller, which are four of the busiest parks we have, and there's no way that we can limit the non-essential visitors uh, interaction there. Then lastly, I also thought this was kind of interesting out of Lara was particularly concerned about aquatic venues. They believe it's even more important there to promote the physical distancing of at least six feet, at least six feet in and out of water because kids can't wear masks when they're in the pool. So after considering all of those things, we stayed with our original decision, which was to not host camp for the summer. I'll go through these a little bit quicker, but this is basically current status of all of the amenities we have in the parks. So athletic fields, they can open up June 22nd for rentals, for practices. Uh, already have the basketball courts are open for shooting, but not for games. We were able to open the liveries. Uh, just a couple of things I do wanna point out on the liveries, we are not offering any rentals or sales of tubes at this time, and that is to uh, do everything we can to keep the crowds a little bit less in the Cascades. We're also having to limit the amount of people on the livery vans, and as a result of that, the uh, kind of amount that we're at right now is I'd say we're running at maybe one third to 40% of capacity compared to what we would usually be doing in June. And that is in order for us to be able to comply with all of the safety guidelines in place. Bryant Community Center is open for essential services. They've been busy. Uh, for Cobblestone Farm is still closed and I anticipate it will be closed for a little while yet. The majority of events that we do there have over 100 people and is of course indoors, so that can't take place right now. At the farmer's market, we are open. We're actually going into phase three tomorrow, which means we'll be back to regular hours, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. You're still able to pick up curbside. You can also shop in person. There are less vendor stalls assigned than usual to help with uh, physical spacing there. Volunteer events, which really speaks to NAP and also the Give365, they're just beginning to start up again since we can have small groups outside. And for the golf courses, we kind of spoke about them earlier, but they're open and really now they're, they're almost back to normal. There are still kind of limits to the amount of people that can be in the clubhouse and certain adjustments on the golf course, but they're operating uh, pretty well. So the outdoor pools, we have actually decided to open fuller on July 1st. Now, Part of the reason why it's only one pool instead of all three is staffing levels are really quite a challenge right now. We believe that we have enough staff lifeguards to be able to open one pool, but not all three. And that is in part due to the fact that throughout the stay at home order, there were lots of things which couldn't happen, which we would usually do in April and May, which would be to train lifeguards. Those kind of things are not considered essential services. So, as it stands right now, we have kind of a gap between the amount of qualified staff and the amount of pools that we would have to open. When we do open Fuller, it's gonna look pretty different than it usually does. We're gonna ask that people reserve 90 minute time slots. They'll be able to do this online or over the phone and they can do it either for lap swimming or for family swim times. Um, there's not going to be any swim lessons. Um, there won't be shared equipment out on the pool deck, but we are uh, committed to opening up July 1st. And I think it'll be, while it isn't perfect, it is something that we can offer that I believe uh, quite a few people in the community will appreciate and enjoy. So we are, uh, the skate park is open and so are playgrounds again. And soon, starting on July 1st, you'll be able to rent the pavilions and shelters so long as you have 100 people or less and you're able to provide us the plan for how you're gonna socially distance. Moving into the financial impact, and I'm almost done here. Um, 
regards to revenue, so the camp refunds that we had to issue came to about $450,000. The good news is that means that all our camps were basically full months before they were scheduled to take place. Um, those have all been issued and we certainly hope to see a lot of those kids and a lot of the families next year. Usually between March and the end of June, there would be about another million dollars in revenue that would come into parks. You know, uh, that's not going to happen right now because obviously the outdoor pools are all closed this fiscal year. There was an early end to the hockey season. We're not able to rent cobblestone. We're not able to rent shelters, pavilions, even the golf courses and liveries while they're open, they got off to later starts than usual. We are able to reduce expenses, but not at the same rate that the revenue reduction um, is occurring. It's kind of hard to say right now, but I think we're going to save about $500,000 on expenses. A lot of that comes from seasonal pay for all of the facilities that are not open. But a lot of our expenses are fixed costs, and there's, there's not a great deal in, in the short term that we can do about that. As we move ahead for FY21, we're gonna update the budget as the year progresses. So city council approved the uh, FY21 budget in May. And I think the idea was basically to approve the plan that was before them, that was what we knew before COVID. Understanding that we don't know enough right now to make an accurate budget and instead to update it as the year goes on. These will be conversations we have as a group for sure. Um, we'll have a better idea as to the demand, the staffing models. We may have to talk about fee adjustments. And then starting this winter is when we actually begin the, the uh, process for FY22 and 23. Just to end on what I hope is more of a positive note, you know, I think throughout all of the coronavirus, the last like three months or so, if it has done anything to me, it has certainly highlighted the importance and the need uh, for public outdoor spaces, for people to recreate, for people uh, just to get out and create some level of enjoyment and quality of life. You know, as we've reopened facilities, so many people have uh, shared with us how important it is that these things come online again as they play just a huge role in their lives. Um, one other thing which we're really encouraged by is it appears that the demand for the activities is absolutely still there. We weren't sure, for example, when we opened the golf courses or the liveries if anybody was gonna come. There are people coming out and I, I think, I hope as things uh, continue to hopefully improve and relax, we'll see uh, kind of the use where it's always been. Lastly, we also were able to use this as an opportunity just to try out some new approaches on things which we've spoken about in the past, but we haven't really had the ability to try. Um, for example, at the canoe liveries, we've oftentimes talked about, is it possible to do online reservations? Instead of having the line that exists there, if you were there last year, you'd show up, you'd be in line for an hour to 90 minutes. So I think it has provided us opportunities to try things that um, as we move ahead, we may well continue to use. And lastly, just, you know, it's also kind of hammered home to me that the park system is, has a lot of employees that care just hugely about what they do. They're creative problem solvers. They want really, really badly to have the parks open and for the programs to run while, I mean, of course, keeping people safe, but uh, having that staff to work with uh, is really important. And I think the parks are in very good hands because of them. And that is everything I will stop talking, which I'm sure you'll be happy about. Colin, thank you for that yeah. presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments for Colin? Lauren. Short question, comment. Um, Colin, what is the response that you've gotten from folks using the online reservation system and things like that? I, I think my family has rented some boats for next weekend and we found that a fairly seamless process. Although of course, I think you have to choose the time before you choose the day. 
which is a little bit weird. Um, but I wondered if is the feedback you're getting generally positive or folks running into some hiccups or? Yeah, I think overall it's actually been quite positive and we've also got more compliance than we expected. So for example, at the golf courses, when they opened up there, it was extremely strict. We couldn't have the clubhouse open at all. So there was an interaction between a staff person inside and the public outside. And we asked people uh, to either do online over the phone. The first weekend we had 90% uh, compliance, which really amazed me because they also had to pay in advance, which uh, is not what you typically do for golf. You pay when you show up. So from what I hear, it's been working pretty well. There are certainly glitches, like you say, with you have to choose a time before the day. Um, we'll continue to work through those, but it is actually working fairly well. Ruth, you have a question? Uh, comments, really? First of all, um, Colin, I want to like thank you and your staff for, uh, you know, I think doing a really good job rolling with the punches and um, adapting as things change and knowing that they're going to continue to change for the next nine months at least. Um, I'm super glad that you're able to try and open Fuller, even though it's not going to be perfect, um, and that you're opening the, um, uh, the, you know, the cascades, the canoes, the kayaks. Um, I, I have, um, <clears throat> I saw the 163 park challenge mm -hmm. and I thought, I'm up for that. I'm a parks commissioner. I've probably been to two thirds of the parks, but I haven't been to all of them. So uh, yeah, that's my goal for the summer. And a suggestion would be that you um, work with the AADL, the District Library Summer Game, to do some uh, parks badges. As I know, I'm a summer game player, and I would, um, I'd love the chance to get some badges and visit the 163 parks. Um, and then I'm wondering if you could just. Uh, talk a little bit about management. Like for instance, you're not providing tubes, but some people are using tubes. I know that people are hanging out on the docks at Bandemir. I know you're concerned at the skate park um, about people being close together. So just wondering if you can talk about how you like, what's the staff approach to managing this stuff? Yeah, um, it's not easy, honestly. So on the river, um we have once kind of people are on the water there's kind of a limited amount that we can do the water is state run and it's the marine sheriff enforces things on the water but what we're doing in the cascades is we're having more staff uh support there we've actually also been working with police just to ask them to have like a presence um I think that seems to help when we have somebody there who's able to walk up and down and just kind of keep eyes on people. It helps definitely. Um, we're also um, on kind of the dock for Bandemir. We have actually tried to barricade it just to keep people off uh, from there for the time being, but that's not really working very well. I think um, what we continue to try to do and we will just keep doing is communication through online, through every way that we can reach people just to share the information. Um, it is hard as I'm sure you've all seen. I think that there's a part of the population which has reached the point where they're not so concerned and then you still have an awful lot of people who are and trying to find kind of the balance of that enforcing things um, is not the easiest, so. I think <clears throat> I wondered at Bandemir about maybe putting a capacity sign. In other words, like maybe 20 people, I don't think you can keep, like if people go out there in a group of four, yeah. I don't think you can keep them apart. But if, but if you were to sort of analyze that really distance wise, 
you could have, you know, five or six groups out there, maybe people would observe, oh, there's already 30 people. Yeah, we uh, could certainly try that. It, it is kind of an interesting space, the dock there, because even before coronavirus, oftentimes it would be overrun with sunbathers and that caused a lot of problems for the people who actually wanted to use kind of the, um, as a launch, as it was expected to be used for, for rowing. So we can certainly try the capacity idea. I like that. Julie, do you have a question or comment? Um, I just wanted to respond to about, um, about enforcement um, and, and management because I had, you know, a few calls from constituents very early on about concerns about um, particularly younger people not social distancing in the parks and what I would tell them and in conversations I've had with Chief Cox. Um, I think it's important to know that, that those efforts by police are expected to be educational right. and not punitive in nature. And every communication I've given to a constituent has been, you know, police are, are happy to go out and, and educate, but this is not how we introduce anyone to the criminal justice system by violating social distancing. So I just wanted to just mention that as a comment in case you know anyone's concerned about that. Any other questions or comments? Rachel. I just wanted to comment, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, uh, Rachel and then Praveena. I wanted to give my usual shout out to the folks managing your social media. It's great. It's a hard time to be conveying information in such few characters. And there's been a lot of times where I've gone on Twitter right after getting an update from you and seeing it conveyed on social media. And I think that's great that you guys are trying every possible communications channel. And I know the information is reaching me at least. I appreciate that. I'll for sure share that with them. Thanks. Pravina. Did you have a question or comment? Uh, just a comment. I just also wanted to give appreciation for all the great work your teams, the teams are doing. Um, I did go to the farmer's market and I was really appreciative of the easy use of walking around, all the signage, the staff that was on site to give direction of which way to go, which was the optimal way of, of crossing or crossing across the parking lot to get to where we wanted to go. Um, so I, I appreciate all the, the staff that was on site to make it easy. I haven't been in a few uh, weekends, but I've heard also the same uh, results from other um, people in the community who've used uh, the farmer's market. I'd love to just second what both Rachel and Pravina said. I think that the, Colin, you and your staff have done an excellent job of communicating throughout all this on social media and signage. I've had several neighbors and friends comment on the signage at the parks and tennis courts, basketball courts. Um, and it's very, they're, they're well done. They're easy to see, they're very clear. Um, and I agree at the farmer's market as well. It's so nicely signed and in some ways it's a more efficient shopping process than it used to be. So good job. Thank you, thank you. Um, Julie. Can I just quick shout out that um, also from the, from the council side, like parks communications are probably the most uniformly praised um, by council members <laughs> because they've been so thorough and um, and really have provided us with information that we can share in a in both a thorough but digestible format. So um, I, I really do appreciate both the thoroughness and and the digestibility of those comments. Thank you. Thanks very much. Any uh, Jeff? Yeah. Uh, thanks. I second what 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 uh, Councilwoman Grand just said there. It's it's awesome. Can um, can uh, can we share part or all of this presentation? Is that all right? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Okay, because I know it has like some future dates in there, you know, not yep. for long, but. Right. Okay, thank you. Yep, absolutely. All right, any other questions or comments? Praveena. Sure, I have a question. Um, what is the plan if, if there is, I, I saw that you showed the Governor Whitmer's, um, I think it's a five or six stage plan. Mm -hmm. So, um, is there a contingency in place if there's a second wave? Um, and what is the response time? I know that I know that you've learned a lot from the first wave, but if there is a second, what is is there is there plans in place? 
Yeah, I mean, the best that what we're kind of working under the assumption now is there's a couple of areas up north that have already allowed more people outside. I think they can have up to 250 outside and 50 people or more inside. So I'm kind of looking at those as what I imagine would be the next step for here. As far as I can tell, we still maintain six foot social distancing in things that we're doing. So, you know, it depends on the facility. If that means we can have larger outdoor special events, that's great. We're kind of ready to do that. Um, it probably won't change how the outdoor pool is used um, because the way that we have that set up now is, um, I suppose, around the six foot concern. Um, but yeah, I think we're basically, we're ready to respond to what comes. Um, most everything will be up and running or ready to run. Any other comments or questions about Colin's report? All right, Colin, thank you for all that information. You're welcome. <laughs> um, moving forward in the agenda, item 7B, report from Recreation Advisory Commission. Um, Ruth, I think you, you're no longer our RAC. That is correct. That's correct. My right? term on RAC, I was term limited on RAC. Um, our illustrious council members voted me in as a regular old member. That's what I thought. RAC. Yeah. And, um, but I will say that the um, April RAC meeting were end of March, I forget which it was, but it was canceled. Uh, due to the COVID stuff, and there won't be a meeting till September. So I don't imagine there will be a replacement until okay. the fall. Okay. Well, that's a good update for now. Thank you. Um, 7C, we don't have any other reports from relevant commissions, committees, boards, or task forces. So moving on to, oh, Julie? I have just kind of like a new business. It's not really a task force, but just an FYI. Sure. Um, that I think would fall under this umbrella. Um, Zach Ackerman, who's my Ward 3 um, partner on, on council, um, we were reached out to by some constituents who live um, in the neighborhood kind of behind St. Francis. Um, and there's a park, Winchell Park, that's back there and Winchell Street. And I guess there's a history of this neighborhood that many of the streets were named after um, kind of famous U of M for faculty members. Um, and unfortunately, um, Professor Winchell seems to have been, I don't know if it's some kind of eugenicist, but some, someone that, um, whose work is now, um, at least according to the neighbors, used um, by alt-right white, white, su alt white supremacy groups. So um, you can imagine there's some, some concern about that. So I've already um, talked to Colin <laughs> Uh, about about sort of the process for it, and I'll let him speak to that. But but how we might rename the park, renaming the street, is something that Zach and I will probably um, maybe look at as a as sort of a joint resolution. Um, we so we're going to be meeting with interested neighbors, Zach and I, later this Friday. But I just wanted to make you all aware of that. If you had any questions, um, I don't have a lot of information at this time, other than. Um, I'm, I'm hoping this isn't going to be a, a controversial thing to do on council. I suspect what we name it will be the harder part <laughs> if we do um, go on and change the name. Um, we just want to, you know, there are going to be some legal things. So um, Colin, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but I just really wanted to give this group a heads up. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I would add, we would um, have to go back and find, well, oh, okay. I'm on. Um, we would have to go back to find kind of the original language when the property was accepted by council and kind of how that was done and if there were any restrictions or anything like that just to understand the background. But certainly from a perspective of if the name of the park is uh, associated with a person like this at this time, staff would uh, completely support the renaming of it and one of the things that I would suggest too would be that 
if there's anybody we know, like a research student, a history buff, anyone like that, it might not be a bad idea to review uh, kind of the park names overall. We've had parks since the 1800s, late 1800s, and and there are quite a few that have names attached to them. It might be kind of a wise idea just to take kind of like a broader look at things in addition to this specific park. Great, thank you for bringing that to our attention, Julie. Um, so there's no action to take right now, but it sounds like we'll have more information in the future, especially after you and Zach meet with more of the neighbors. Yeah, we're gonna meet with them on Friday. So I just, I put off the meeting with the neighbors until I could come to this group because I, I just, if there was any input or feedback, I wanted to make sure that I could bring it to them Friday. Great. Does anyone in this group have any comments or questions about that? Okay, well, thanks, Julie, for bringing that up. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, other items in new business. Uh, we have a resolution to recommend that the city grant a pathway easement and a grading permit to the Charter Township of Ann Arbor in Marshall Nature Area. And we have Karen Sikenga, I hope I said that right, uh, joining us today. Karen is with the Huron River Group and she'll be presenting to us on behalf of Ann Arbor Township. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Karen Sickinga, like Paige said, and I'm a I'm with the Huron River Group, and I'm working on completing. We call it the Mathai Botanical Gardens Trail. Um, and Pravina, you might remember me. I used to be um, an administrator at um, Mathai Botanical Gardens, and when I was at Mathai, we had as a strategic planning goal connecting Mathai Botanical Gardens to campus with non-motorized transportation. Um, and so when I was there, we completed what we called phase one of that trail, which was connecting Parker Mill and the B2B trail to Mathai Botanical Gardens. At that time, we, we had originally wanted to do the, the whole trail, which would have gone from Parker Mill to Plymouth Road, um, but because of easement issues and, and university ownership and so on, we decided to split it into two um, phases. I then left the university, um, formed my own consulting firm, and Ann Arbor Township hired me. We, we did that phase one in collaboration with Ann Arbor Township. Much of the funding is available only to local government entities. So we built, the Botanical Gardens built a very strong relationship with Ann Arbor Township. And then when I left the gardens, there was really nobody at the gardens to champion the trail. And so Ann Arbor Township said, well, we'll take the lead on the next phase, which completes the the this critical north-south connection between what SEMCOD considers to be two um, um, non-motorized transportation corridors in Washtenaw County, Plymouth Road, and the B2B Trail. So SEMCOG has provided us this, really the significant funding, um, and the reason they've done that is because they consider Plymouth Road and the B2B to be the two non-motorized transportation corridors. But again, as an administrator at the gardens, um, we, we managed um, some of the natural areas that are contiguous to Marshall Nature Area. Um, and we felt like it would be really awesome to, to push the trail, not just to Plymouth Road, but, uh, but 500 feet north of that to M Marshall Nature Area, which would then allow like our students and volunteers and so on to walk um, safely from the gardens up to, up to the nature area. Um, and when I first started working on this phase two project, um, I, I had actually hoped to get um, Natural Resources Trust Fund dollars to help pay for this. That, uh, and, and they're interested in making these green space to green space connections. They didn't end up funding this. So that's no longer a requirement of this project. But in talking with Dave Borneman and with Colin, I think we and the Ann Arbor Township trustees, everybody still thinks that it would be really nice if if we could just push it up this these last few hundred feet to Marshall Nature Area. So so we're just kind of inviting you guys, I guess, to participate in the trail if you would like. It's not. Um, it's not high pressure because it's not a requirement of any of our funding sources. We just think that it would be that would that it would be a nice 
uh, amenity for the community to have people be able to get to Marshall Nature Area. And I can tell you as a former administrator of the Botanical Gardens, the planners that we worked with at that time told us that you know the botanical gardens was not accessible except by car before we built that that the phase one trail there's no public bus um, and there was no um, sidewalk or any way really to get there safely except by car um, and so the planners i was working with said well you should assume that you're going to see about a 10 percent increase in in use of the botanical gardens once you connect into a transportation system in this way we were pretty skeptical of that. I don't think we thought we were gonna um, see that kind of increase in use, but in fact we have. So um, so the phase one trail, the one that connects to the B2B um, was uh, open to the public. I think it was in October of 2015 and we and the Botanical Gardens has seen um, at least a 10% increase in visitation since the trail opened. And if you've ever walked on that trail, you can see that it's very widely used. Um, so, so this is just an invitation from Ann Arbor Township, and then we understand from Colin and and just watching the presentation that he just gave. I under we under I think Ann Arbor Township knows that the Parks Department does not have the funding to contribute to the project at this time, um, so they are. Um, I'm going to try to raise the money that we need. There's just a $60,000 funding gap at this point, and they're willing to kind of take financial responsibility for this last little bit of the trail um, and fold that into the Ann Arbor Township fundraising effort. So we're not asking for funding from you at this time. Um, we're just asking for the easement. So, I mean, that's really, I don't, I don't have a formal presentation. I don't know if anybody has any questions or. Yeah, Karen, that was, that yeah. was great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there is a, a nice FAQ that was attached in our packet, but does anyone have any questions for Karen right now or for Colin? I can add that I uh, spoke to Dave Borderman on this and he is completely supportive of it. The area where the, the uh, easement is proposed, absolutely fine. Um, not any high quality anything there. It's essentially the road right away. And I think it would be a nice connection as uh, explained by Karen for sure. And I, I did talk with the road commission today because they're managing the projects and so much of it is from MDOT funded. And, and they, they said basically you should plan on the tree, the, the, the trees in that little green space. If you went back to that map, that little, that little strip of green between there's this future that red line there is a future right turn lane that's a separate project has nothing to do with me but it's something that the road commission is doing and and it's going to happen pretty soon then there's that little strip of green and then the orange is the trail so that green will be will will the trees will will have to go between these two projects they're not going to be able to preserve the trees um, so that's going to become like a grassy a grassy shoulder um, but I think in talking to Colin and my own feeling and just going out and looking at it is two things. One is, even if you said no to the trail, the trees are probably still going to have to go because of that right turn lane that the, that the road commission is going to be putting in. And two, those trees are not, I mean, there's, there's like a couple hickories maybe, but there's really, they're not, they're mostly just weed trees that have grown up in the, in the in the road commission right away so they're not there was nothing in there that made me feel like oh you know this is a precious tree and we don't want to remove it ruth did you have a comment or question i think it would be a great addition a question Pravina. um thanks karen for your presentation um just to remind me that right now if you go back to the drawing down if you scroll down slightly it had a pedestrian walkway. Is that, that's not existing currently, is it? No, that pedestrian walkway is part of this trail project. Okay, would it be then a, a light or a, um, a signal-based yeah. crosswalk or just an open crosswalk? No, it's gonna be a signalized crosswalk. Okay, and then there's also gonna be a signalized mid-block crossing that's, that's a little bit farther north. I, I'm not sure that it shows on this site plan. Um, I mean, a little bit, 
farther south that is across, you know, there are those subdivisions that are on the other side of Plymouth Road that there's, there's I think a couple hundred um, uh, uh, houses in there and, uh, and two or three driveways that come out onto Dixborough Road. And there's gonna be a signalized mid block crossing um, um, just before one of the driveways into the into the um, subdivision there. And that was really important to me personally, because when I was working at the Botanical Gardens, one of our student workers actually got hit by a car at that spot, crossing the road. It was a student who lived at North Campus and was riding his bike. And um, he was doing, he was a very earnest kid and he did everything right. And he was wearing, you know, bright reflective clothing and all of that, but he still got hit by a car trying to cross the road there. And this driver was also very nice and very upset about it. And, and she, just, she just hadn't seen him. And so this was really, I'm really r glad that this is, it seems like it's gonna move forward now. And, I, and I'm glad about that because I think people are always darting across the road there. And especially even more so now that that trail is in place because, because there's a lot more non-motorized use around there. So, so between that corner crossing and then the mid block crossing, I'm hoping that there's gonna be enhanced pedestrian safety in that, in that whole area. And the population is growing, becoming much more dense over there. So it's good all the way around, I feel. It's almost the road between the two cities or Dixborough and Ann Arbor. Yeah. Is this Ann Arbor Township or Ann Arbor? This is Ann Arbor Township. Um, um, yeah, this is this is a kind of fragmented area, but this is Ann Arbor Township. Okay. The, the park is Ann Arbor, is city of Ann Arbor, but, the, but it's located within Ann Arbor Township. Thank you. The other side of the street is Superior Township. The actual crossroad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those complicated, multi-jurisdictional little areas. Good. Um, so we have us before us, I'll just read it, the resolution again. It's a resolution to recommend that the city grant a pathway easement and a grading permit to the Charter Township of Ann Arbor in Marshall Nature Area. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? Motion by Ruth. Is there a second? I see a second. I'm sorry. I'm trying to switch back and forth. I'll second. Oh, second by Stephen. Thank you. Any other comments or discussion? All right. All in favor of the resolution, please raise your hands and say aye. 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 Any opposed, please raise your hand. All right. Great. Motion passes. And Karen, thank you so much for joining us for this virtual meeting today. Oh, you're welcome. A question for you. Should I stay on the line for the public comment period in case there are public questions about this, or is it okay for me to sign off? Uh, I'm going to let Colin or Kristen answer that. Um, you could certainly stay on if you would like. Uh, it wouldn't be actually, if there are questions, they would be directed to staff, but yeah, you could certainly stay on. Fair warning that it may be quite a me? long time before public comment comes back around. Yeah, I would just as soon not stay on the line if you guys are okay with me signing off, but I'm, I would be sure. happy to if you think it, if you think it would add value. No, I'm absolutely fine with you signing off. I, I would be surprised if we get a call of concern, but if we do, I think we can handle it. And from here, this will move on to city council. Um, okay, great. And uh, I can also be in touch with the steps for that. Okay, okay. great. Thank you, Colin. Thanks for facilitating yep. all this. I appreciate yep. it. Thanks, Thank you. Karen. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Moving on to item nine. Commission proposed business. Uh, it is time for us to appoint a PAC member to the Environmental Commission. So in the past, uh, Mike Apple has served this role and he is willing to be reappointed. I think everyone knows Mike well. Um, so all I would need is a motion to reappoint Mike Apple to the Environmental Commission. He's still on PAC. Is that how yes. that works? Is yes. PAC? 
Yep, he's still on PAC, and so he would be our um, liaison between PAC and the Environmental Commission. Um, he's done a great job, I think, in the past of providing us with, you know, Environmental Commission perspective and vice versa. Seems a little bit like we're uh, tasking him with something in his absence, but if you're sure he's okay with it, then yeah, I will. To be fair, Colin has reached out to him already and confirmed with him that if we are willing to reappoint him, he will accept the, the appointment. So perfect. Colin has, Colin has been in touch with him and confirmed that. So it won't be a surprise to him if he's reappointed. All right, so moved. All right, great. Motion by Lauren. Is there a second? Second by Rachel. Yep, I second. Okay. Great. Um, all in favor of appointing Mike Apple to the Environmental Commission, please raise your hands. Great. Any opposed? No. Nope. Okay. Well, we'll leave it to Colin to uh, pass on the good news to Mike. I will do that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, item 10, land acquisition matters. Um, I hope I get this right, but Remy can correct me if I am wrong. So we are going to leave this Zoom session and in the email that Kristen sent out earlier, there is a link to sign in to the LAC portion of this meeting. Um, we'll conduct our LAC business. If there are any motions, uh, we'll read those when we resume this PAC meeting after LAC. Hope I said that okay. So, all right, I will see you all in the closed session here since it's public, or does that not matter? Because the other link is not public, right? That is correct. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, we need a motion to move into closed session to conduct lack business. Motion by Ruth, seconded by Pravina. All right, all in favor, please raise your hands. Great, okay, so we are moving into closed session for LAC.
open session for PAC. Um, moving on to item 11, the second public comment section. Kristen, do we have anyone on the phone for public comment? No speakers. Okay, thank you. Item 12, communications uh, were included in the email packet that was sent out. Item 13, we don't need another closed session. So item 14, we are adjourned. Thank you everyone for sticking along for this extra long virtual meeting. And hey, Colin. hopefully we'll see you all soon. Colin. Thank you. Can, yep. I, can, Thank I, you. can I catch you real quick? Thanks everybody. Yeah. Hey, um, bye bye.